Still not talking to you. What's up, everybody? This is What They Play, Episode 8. My guest today could probably tell you about an F1 car. He could probably give you some life advice, but he's probably going to tell you about the new thing that he's doing right now, formerly GameSpot.com. It is Danny O'Dwyer. How you doing, sir? Great. Delighted to be on here. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much for, for getting me on. It's a great way to start your Friday morning is talking about video games with someone. Man, I got to tell you, before, like, you're thanking me for, for this, but, but honestly, thank you. And the people who don't know why I'm saying that, I'm going to tell you right now. Last week, I had a bunch of malfunctions in life, and I was really thinking, you know what? You're busy. The interview can't be rescheduled. But sure enough, you messaged me back right away when I had the reschedule, and you said, yeah, let's do it. And we're, now we're here today. I want to say thank you openly just right now. Thank you, Danny. No worries. My pleasure. You can't help what happens in your day-to-day -day and, like... As it turns out right now, my schedule is like the most open thing in the world, so I'm more than happy to make time for good people to, <laughs> to, to have a chat. Well, that's awesome, and, and I do appreciate it. Now, on the show, we kind of have a format that we like to go by. It's, it's uh, some more serious questions about you, about your past, about what you're doing, then some for fun, silly questions that we just get into. And then I always like to outsource some fan questions because people love to, to, to pick people's brains. So I got a few of those at the end as well. But the tradition is, we like to go back at first. We like to take it back. Okay. and Because uh, everybody's story is unique. Everybody's story is different. And I want to know more about your story, about how you got started in journalism, and what led you to the road that you're on right now. Sure. Uh, I mean, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> um, well, not, the doctor hasn't, like, it's past the slapping on the butt. You've cried. You've okay. Grown up. Okay, we're past that. <laughs> uh, I guess, for me, I, you know, everyone's story sort of, Come, everyone's comes from a different pr perspective, right? So mine was from the southeast of Ireland at a time in like, you know, I was born in 86. So I grew up in the 90s and, and the early 2000s, just kind of where the, in the way the Internet was like starting to connect Ireland to the rest of the world. Uh, and we're kind of a weird little country. We're like an interesting, um, unique place because we're an English speaking country, but we're also very far away from other English speaking countries, it kind of feels like. Like England feels like it's miles away when you're a child. America feels like it's in a, on a different planet. So culturally, we're super like, we're like a new country as well. And, and we're, culturally, we sort of like feed off of other stuff. Like we love embracing other things. And what was happening when I was growing up was that the internet was really allowing that stuff to permeate Ireland in a much more. Uh, fluid way that it ever had done before for previous generations. Even, even my like my sister and brother, when they were growing up, they didn't have access to the type of stuff I did. So, what was going on, I guess, is that I grew up reading magazines, which was sort of, you know gaming magazines, PC Gamer, which was my window into the world of video games. Um, outside of just conversations in my high school and. The, when the internet sort of blew up uh, and I got like internet connection for the first time, I typed video games into what well, it was probably Yahoo actually. It was before Google, right? Alta Vista or something. Uh, and GameSpot came up because they were like videogames.com. So that's how I ended up going on GameSpot. And then for years after that, 
consuming GameSpot and then getting broadband and being able to watch <laughs> videos. Uh, and that's where I sort of came across people like Rich Gallup and Jeff Gerstmann, who had been at Dare for, for years and years, and kind of thought, huh, maybe that's something I'd like to do, you know? That's... It's almost like a like a prophecy. You you, you type it in, and there it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. It's weird looking back now after everything's happened because for the longest time, like I kind of had it in the back of my head that I'd like to do this, but I never really put much stock in that it was. It seemed like a shot in the dark because it seemed like the type of job lots of people would want to do. Mm-hmm. I was living in a sort of a weird part of the world, so I, I didn't. I wouldn't live near any places where you could get those jobs. Um, so I was my, my first career was web design, and I've been doing that since I was 15. Um, and I went to college for it, and I ran a web development company for years, and like that was my bread and butter. Like I, I knew how to make sites, and I loved doing it. Uh, but then on the side, I was doing other things, like I worked in theater, and I started working in radio, and sort of like doing things which were... You know, they're not really games coverage or, I guess, video stuff sort of crept in as well. But they were like adjacent. So they were kind of, you know, you learn about talking to people through radio a lot. You know about how to use your voice in radio. And in theater, you get rid of your ego and you get rid of your um, anxiety about social situations as well. It's like stuff like that sort of like helped. And then I kind of made a conscious decision when I got out of college that I was going to do the games. uh, I was going to do my web development stuff. But that all the game stuff I'd been doing on my friends, like we, I built a website and we had a podcast and all that. That I, I'd keep doing that as well, and like hopefully use that to break into the games industry, uh, which then led me to moving to London, because I had this idea that Gamespot has an office in London. So if I move to London, I don't need to like the EU is a wonderful thing. I could just move to London and maybe see if I can get a job there. And maybe if I got a job there, they'd maybe transfer me to the American office. Like maybe that'll that'll happen. Um, and like. You just called your own shots. I mean, it was weird. (laughs) And the weird thing was, was that I'd I'd tried this for like five years and I'd gotten an interview at GameSpot and had been turned down and I failed to get an interview on three other occasions um, through applying. And I had thrown in the towel. I was moving actually to the Middle East. I was the day that I sent a truck worth of stuff out of London back to my hometown. I got a an email from uh, who then ended up being my boss in the UK Chris Beaumont mm-hmm. saying something's come up we have a position would you be interested <laughs> and I was like you're fucking kidding like I mo- I'm, I've am I'm, I've handed in my notice of my other job I've just moved all my shit out of London and then it, it, it was like the perfect thing though because it was like how much do you want this because even my partner at the time was moving to um, the Middle East with me and like she was still going and I mean, we're, <laughs> I'm married to someone else now, so that tells you how much <laughs> I needed the job at GameSpot. Um, yeah, like I, I ended up staying and then had two and a half wonderful years at GameSpot. And as it happens, I kind of joined at a good time when they didn't have that many faces on the site. They didn't have that many people who were doing video work who were also kind of a little bit editorial. So uh, they got my ass over to America and <laughs> the rest the rest is history. I can't believe, like, it's it's crazy to me that I, it was five years at GameSpot. Because people talk to me and go, like, oh, you've been in the industry for years. And it's like, like, not really. I was, like, 26, I think, <laughs> when I broke in. Like, I was I was old. I was, you know, uh, I'd already got all the gray hairs by then. But, uh, yeah, like, I, I'm super lucky and privileged that I got the, the chance to spend five years there. But the same as everyone else, it took a lot of work to, to make it happen, you know. Wow. Um, it is, I, I'm listening to it, and I'm, I'm just kind of amazed and there was that gap of time where you were turned down and then brought on but you really did have a path set and I think that's important for people to remember is like that goal like even though you were doing the necessary things like a I don't want to call fallback plans but you had other plans that you were putting in place if that didn't work and uh but you never like lost sight of it so that's like really super inspirational that's that's really cool it's it's strange because I didn't like the weirdest thing about the whole situation is that I tried and tried and tried for years and it wasn't until I stopped trying for like two months because I was leaving that the call came. And it, like <laughs> easily the person who gave me the offer could have like seen on Twitter that I hadn't been posting pod or I hadn't. I think we'd still been doing the podcast, but I hadn't been posting like reviews and I hadn't been doing half as much game stuff. And they could have been like, oh, I guess, you know, or it could have seen that I was moving like he didn't know. And I'd been talking about it. So mm. there is an alternate universe where 
<laughs> which is really scary to me because then that makes you think, oh God, you have to be obsessive about this. But there is like an alternative universe where that email never came and yeah. and, it, and it never happened because I had taken my foot off the gas, which like that drives me crazy because then that make like I've already got OCD. So that's like, mm-hmm. that like makes me think, oh man, you have to never let your guard <laughs> down about anything. Um, but like it's, uh, people ask me all the time about breaking into an industry. It, it requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of effort, but like it is still a crapshoot. Like, it's people I like saying to people that I was turned down three times, not because like I was turned down three times and rah rah I got in. But it's like people when they talk to me about this stuff, because I was so lucky to be the face of one of the, you know, biggest or oldest gaming websites in the world. But like it, it could have easily not happened. And in fact they turned me down so many times that like it shouldn't have happened. So what I you know, even people who folks think are so qualified to do the job get turned down. Mm-hmm. So it's just like a kind of a, it's a, a lucky crapshoot as much as it is uh, the amount of like effort you put into this stuff as well, you know. I'm trying to make it on YouTube. You talk to me about lucky crapshoots, right? <laughs> I mean, even exactly the people who are. If you talk to people about like why they're successful on YouTube, they'll give you all these answers. But the real reason is they don't fucking know because the, <laughs> there's someone else who's doing literally the same thing they did who didn't get you know. Exactly. YouTube algorithms are this this bizarre beautiful thing and that's the most messed up thing is that i used to think back five years ago when i broke in that it was impossible to break into the games industry and then people ask me like which you know it's easier now right because there's more access to it and i'm like yes they've democratized everything but that means that there's like five million times more people trying to do it like when i was doing it i thought i was i i kind of felt like all right some people know this is a thing you can do for work but like not that many people know it's not you know people were still going oh you talk about games like you write them or, you know, it was like now that the idea of a YouTuber is kind of in the, you know, zeitgeist a bit more. Sure. So, yeah, I feel for you, man. It's 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 way harder. And also advertising revenue is nowhere near as good as it was five years ago. So that makes it harder, too. But that's uh, that's why I don't do advertising anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Fans of the channel will notice there was a little edit here. I was fixing some technical difficulties, but we're going to keep moving forward. I want to bring us up to speed. You've given us the story of the past. Now we have a lot of things to talk about, about the future and what you're doing right now. No clip. I mean, <laughs> to tell me about it and tell other, pe- other, other people what you're doing. It's so interesting. It's really weird to hear people say the word because it's been rattling around my head for so long that... <laughs> It's like to see it out there in in the world is like is like sending your baby to school or something. It's like oh god, nobody nobody look at it. Um, <laughs> nobody yeah. look at my child in school. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I'm not a parent, right? <laughs> um, no, no clip is kind of an extension of some stuff that I started doing at Gamespot, which was I had my like sort of I guess to use the phrase again, my bread and butter. Um, uh, work that I do and when you work at a site like that you have to work on loads of different productions and you know make sure that you're covering your bases and getting all your views and stuff um but the stuff that I did on the side was sometimes these like video previews that sites do every now and again mm-hmm. I started to take them in like a, a different direction than we used to do them and start to make curated almost like short form mini documentaries about about games before they came out because previews are like generally they were pretty boring and interviews in games are you know for years had been really just badly done like not like another a lot of other medias but for whatever reason in games everyone seemed to be okay we're talking to PR people and asking them the same five questions whereas it's like no let's talk to the developers and let's ask them interesting questions they never get to speak they work on these things for five years uh, and then never get to talk about them so yeah i did a bunch of those i went to poland and did one about The Witcher 3. I went to, I did one with uh, No Man's Sky folks, Sean Murray and that crowd at E3 a couple of years ago. Um, and I went to uh, Blizzard in uh, Anaheim as well and talked to them. And what I loved about this was this was all stuff that was funded by GameSpot. I bought the tickets, I bought the hotels. It wasn't advertising. Um, it didn't have a drop of advertising in it at all. Uh, but the stuff like did really well. Like People watched it and they were fun, interesting stories. And like stories that just no like questions people didn't bother to ask. There wasn't like a massive trick to it. It was just that nobody seemed to give a shit uh, about <laughs> that stuff. Like it's weird. Editorial stuff is really good in games, and then video is really big. Mm-hmm. But 
there's nobody here. There's like hardly anyone in the middle actually making good video editorials. In fact, YouTube is probably where it happens more. Like I love Total Biscuit and Jim Quisition and Jim Sterling and all that stuff. But within the game's press, everyone was like falling short for years. And that's sort of why I wanted to break in. So that stuff started doing really well. Uh, numbers wise and then what I realized was that developers were coming up to me and asking if I do things with them so at E3 this year I had like one of my favorite developers in the world say oh I watched your X video would you ever consider doing it about my game and I was like fucking yes <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like this massive sea change where they, people were like following the work and like were interested in it and they didn't like it because it was like I don't know, baity or anything. They liked it because they thought it like added to the story of games. Sure. So over a couple of months, I sort of did a lot of business planning and budgeting and figured out like, okay, this Patreon thing's worked out for kind of, you know, kind of funny and Greg and easy allies. They've managed to extend the life of, uh, of, of game trailers past the site getting shut down. Like there's something here. And like, I'm a pretty savvy, like I'm an editor and a host and a producer and like I, I, I wear a lot of hats so I don't necessarily have to hire many people. Like I kind of only ever need to hire a camera op for this uh, and then, you know, a camera op that can maybe help me with editing sometimes if it gets too much. So I started doing all the numbers and then I realized that if I got like five grand a month, I could probably do it for a while if I saved up like enough money. Sure. So I saved up shit loads of money for for not shit loads but like lots for me uh over the course of like six months uh and then just decided to take the leap and say look i'll leave this in gamers hands if this is something people care about mm -hmm. then it'll get funded i feel like i have enough of an audience that like some of them would be into it if if they thought it would be worthwhile um and i took the leap and i was i was well, ready for it to not work or for it to not do as you know well as i would hope or yeah. for for it to put me in an awkward financial situation for like six months I, I thought you know i'm newly married we're gonna have kids eventually but i thought like if, if there's ever a time to do it it's now like just it's fine i can eat ramen and, and chill out for a couple of months um but as it happened i mean the day of launch within 24 hours we had hit my top goal which was fifteen thousand a month and now we're almost at we're 2900 patrons actually uh, mm -hmm. after a couple of seconds ago with, with almost 20,000 a month yeah, you were under 500 for, from getting 20,000 I think when I checked it recently right so. yeah so it's up to 543 now so it's even now it's 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 ticking up and traditionally on patreons this is the the week where nothing gets done because it's a week before the start of the the next month <laughs> right. so it's 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 been amazing like the the reaction from people the reaction from developers the people we've been talking to like the documentaries that are getting set up over the next couple of months are like I was I was talking to a guy in Patreon I went to meet them yesterday yesterday two days ago um and one of the guys who was there was a guy who used to watch my old show Escape from Men Stupid on GameSpot so he he's known my work for like 4 years and I said like w you know what would you like that's the one thing I ask everyone was like what documentaries would you like and he mentioned three studios and I said two of those were in active talks with and one of them <laughs> is is going to be talking to us uh when they announce their next thing they've promised so like it's nuts like I think people are going to be super jazzed once we get the docs done and like now, like i want to get the doc like I'm, I'm dying to book the first one like i hopefully i have a kind of a soft confirm for one of them for this week uh, uh or for one of them for shooting in a couple of weeks and i'm hoping to get it confirmed today and then i'll relax a bit more because people are expecting cool shit and i want to make it you know what i mean absolutely and and, and I think people will be more understanding of the time it takes and the effort put in because quality speaks volumes on every platform like this. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that you you mentioned being OCD. I completely understand that as well. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I have no doubt that you're going to do that work and put it and make it the best it can be. Um, you mentioned something earlier that kind of it's a it's an impromptu question I have for you. Uh, you were talking about asking developers questions that they maybe have never been asked before. They felt that you know this was a breath of fresh air. Um, with that, you know you had this churning in your head for a while. You you had this you had this going for a while. I want you to take me back to the human element of all of this and the moment that you decided this is when you're going to make that leap. What was that feeling like? Was it more anxiety than it was relief, or was it you know what kind of feeling did you have when you're like this is it? We're doing it. It's now. It was equal parts like exciting and terrifying, in, and one didn't take away from the other. It was like they were both cranked up to 100. Um, <laughs> and and I, it's weird, right? Because in a way, I don't feel like I ever had that moment. I don't think I ever had the, the, the 
flick. And I've had it with so much other stuff. But for this, it was strange. I'd prepared it for so long. So no clip or it had it didn't have an AR name before, but it didn't have a name mm-hmm. for like five months. I already got it got the name near the end. Um it 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 was ramping up in my head for months and months and months and months. And then the game spot was always game spot work was always there. And then at a certain point when it got here, I had to stop doing this and then all that was left was no, actually that happened because I got because I left work on Friday and then suddenly all <laughs> I had was no clip. And I, it wasn't until I think last Saturday, so a week after the Patreon had had launched, that I like sat back and went, "Oh, I'm fucking like self-employed. Like, <laughs> how did that happen? Like, it, it was. I don't know. I think it was because I had so much anxiety." for so long about it and mm-hmm. what happens to me when i have anxiety about stuff is that i over prepare for things sure so i just like and it's it's nothing like a certain amount of it is like oh having budgets is really good and having you know idea of what you want to do is really good but actually a lot of the planning i did was predominantly a coping mechanism to make sure that i was just not freaking the fuck out so because of that i really felt like i knew everything that was going on and then when i guess i was just planning 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 and the funny thing is, is that actually I could have, I was, I, I've never actually told this anyone before. Um, but exclusive. this was originally supposed to, exclusive. This was originally supposed to launch about six weeks ago. So okay. it was supposed to launch way earlier. And I ended up not having second thoughts, but some <laughs> life stuff happened mm-hmm. that needed, that I needed to like basically bump it a bit. So I think when it actually launched, I was waiting for something to happen again. Maybe I was like, kind of preparing myself for look if something happens i need to push this back again then i i won't be freaking out about it uh, but as it happens nothing everything was cool and i had i had already handed in my notice and and all that so it was it was a done deal uh, so yeah it, it was it was strange it it definitely felt like <laughs> like a process not like a moment which and i was waiting for the moment because you do right when you leave something it's like yeah. leave your job and even when i left my job that day it was, i handed in my badge and i was like I'm going to be back next Tuesday to record a podcast with Drew. This isn't that weird, right? You know? <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very strange. I still feel like I'm in it, you know? Yeah, I mean, that that's, but it's a part of you. You've done it for so long and you've prepared for it for so long. That's a natural feeling. That it It's going to take a lot longer to, to hit you, probably, I would assume. But that leads me kind of the next question is, um... Where do you really see this in a couple years? And and what I mean by that is, are you like looking for the goal to have a PAX panel eventually? Things like that? I think uh, it's weird because a lot of people have been asking this, um, especially because this is one of the things I was worried with the trailer was that I really wanted the trailer to be like, this is what it is now for the next year. Mm-hmm. And I think that most people get what it is, that it's right. like, it's a small team. We're going to be savvy. We're going to cover documentaries uh or make these documentary feature shorts over the course of a month and then we're going to get one of them out uh, uh a month might be the top of the month might be the bottom of the month but like that's the kind of cycle we're going to be working on um but yeah whenever people ask about the future it's obviously like it can go in so many different ways so i mean ultimately i think the work will dictate what direction it goes in um and then like uh, it's not going to be based on the funding the funding isn't going to point in the direction of where this goes, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, at the rate it is now, what we have now, this is very sustainable. It allow me to save up for really crazy projects. So, like I'm talking about stuff uh, um, all over the world, not just in Europe and North America, um, covering interesting things. But like five years down the road, I like I think what I want to do with NoClip is it's not just a way for me to like make money on my own or work for myself or do the things that I want to do. Like I, I made good money and I enjoyed my job at GameSpot and they let me do whatever I wanted. So I could have easily done this on GameSpot. So the reason I didn't is because I wanted to show, and this was sort of like a mission I had years ago is that like, I wanted to show that you can make quality video game content without having to lean on advertising, uh, sure. for it to work, be that a big site that needs to, you know, bring in the money to do this stuff um or you know be it somebody who had an idea and then has to pitch it to a sales company to to get the funding for it which is what happens a lot actually in documentary filmmaking funny enough sure. um and that wasn't possible until very recently it wasn't until i'd seen 
you know, crowdfunding on Kickstarter doesn't really work for, I don't think it works for documentaries full time because the problem with when you're making documentary features, and again, we're not making features, we're making like sets of shorts, um, is that you don't know what the story is until you're in it. So it's really difficult to figure out how much something is going to cost because sometimes you just need to do it for six months extra or sometimes you don't and you pivot and you tell a different story. Um, whereas with this stuff, I kind of, I, I'd done enough of them and I had priced enough of them and I'd done the flights and I'd done the hotels and I'd, I knew the day rates and I, 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 so I know how much this stuff was costing. And then, and I was doing it for like way cheaper than anyone else would do it for. It was like, because it was only, I had to because I was working at GameSpot and like I couldn't take a crew of six people down to a, a thing. We had to be super clever. So what was actually happening was they were sending two people to do a preview anyway. They were sending a camera up and an editor. And then I, if I was the editor, and then what I'd do is just do it differently. So right. well, it's it's super sustainable. The thing is that then people ask about growth and like, do you end up taking people on and do you end up like building? And like, that's a problem to worry about next year or the year late, a year later. I think there is a situation where maybe Noclip you know, has a staff of like three people or something, um, and we do the same amount of work, or we, I have a situation where I can work with other people as hosts and producers or hosts and, and writers, which is what I kind of want to do is, sure. is take people who aren't me, who've got different perspectives and get them in and do things around them. And I have more of a director or producer role, like for, for, for other, you know, not, not for all of them, but for, for specials and stuff. So I think that's kind of where I see it going. I, I don't want this. I want this to really be around for years. I want it to put a line in the sand and say, like, this is possible to, to, to game sites as much as to individuals who have interesting ideas and people who have unique perspectives um, that, like, this stuff is sustainable. It is. You need to have a certain amount of people to do it. But, like, it's 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 the one of the things i want is that the thing about um patreon is that they say a lot of people whenever you get somebody into patreon then they tend to fund about three things the average is about three things converting them into patreon is the trouble because it's like what the fuck is this weird thing <laughs> so i'm also hoping that like greg did it easy allies did it and i'm hoping now if i do this as well then we're going to get more people into this space that more games coverage lovers who are sort of disenfranchised by the big sites can get in here and enjoy right. this and then there's more of a pool of people here for other voices to come in. So that's kind of what I want to do. I, like I want to, I want this to create a wave within games coverage. I want it to be something completely different to what everyone's doing, um, and I want it to grow in only an organic way. I have no interest in becoming like a, a company that hires like 10, 15, 20 people. <laughs> like that's that's not what this is. This is these are small stories made by small teams. This they is aren't. your thing. It's your it's it's your baby. Like in a in a big sense. Like you want to keep that as close to heart. I totally get it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's like what happened with Vice. Like you know, I love Vice. Vice is cool, but Vice was cooler three years ago when it was just like a bunch of really savvy folks. And that's why I'm interested to see what happens with Vice Gaming, because, again, yeah. that's a small team again, so that's kind of cool. But a lot of the Vice editorial stuff has just gotten like too big. Like It's not what it was, and mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed what it was, and I would have funded what it was. What it is now is corporate right. production broadcasting, and that's that's not really for me anymore. You yeah, know? And you're speaking, yeah, you're speaking about an independence issue, too. Like, like how, much, how much of the leash are they allowed to, to, to go out on before it gets tugged you know so as long totally. as it's a long leash it's all good <laughs> and it's the longest leash and the leash is provided by the people who want to watch it like the mm -hmm. fucking weirdest thing about this is that the thing that they'll say about games coverage is that like obviously you need views and you do need views like not just because advertising is important but you as a creator you want to make sure that you're making things that resonate with people and views aren't an ideal science but they give you an idea if people are sharing your work sure. and interested in it and all that right comments as well it's a good way of like figuring out some sort of stuff especially i think especially when you work for a big game website because you know where the median is so you can tell if you're rising above it or if you're falling below um but the thing about this is is that i don't give a shit if anyone <laughs> watches this except for the patrons right like like I obviously do, the and I want the people you know these... who are supporting the the cause. Yeah, that's the only <laughs> people who I like really need to make this stuff for. Which is like, and I want to make it for other people. I want this stuff to be viewable by like everyone. This is just to clarify: the patrons get extra features on this, but sure. the actual documentaries themselves, everyone, this is free for everyone. No advertising on it. I want just people to be able to use this as a locker resource uh, to to learn about games and and love games and figure out what's going on behind them. But it's an amazing feeling to not 
need that. It's, it's like it's a total like weird paradigm shift from my brain where I'm like, oh yeah, the only people I really um entrusted or indebted to are the two hundred two thousand nine hundred people who are who are in on it with me, you know? So it's very, very strange. I think it's a wonderful time for I think it's an interesting time for games coverage right now. What I want is this stuff to become more democratized. Sure. So, you know, folks with interesting voices, folks like you have the opportunity to do this as well. And they don't have to just fight with the big guys because that's kind of what's going on at the moment. Absolutely. I completely understand that. I think we're going to shift gears here really quick. Uh, I, I This has been an information dump. <laughs> There's been a lot <laughs> of stuff here and it's super interesting. And I, I, I'm now 10 times more excited to see what comes out of this. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to ask you, there's a couple of staple questions we have on the show. It's, mm. it's you know, we try to vary it up a little bit, but there's one that always interests me, and uh, it's because of personal experiences that I've had. I played through Until Dawn on the channel with some friends of mine, and the way that we played it was I played an episode, then I handed the controller, and then he handed the controller. So we were constantly messing each other up. And because of that, not the best game, not the worst game, we played it in a unique way, and it holds something special to me. My question to you is, what game have you played, not best, not worst, whatever, but what game have you played that you had in such a unique way that it holds a special place in, to you? I actually, I won't, I'll, as a quick aside, I'll say that I played Until Dawn with my wife last week <laughs> for the first time ever, and the way we played it was... I had the controller, but I did everything she said. Oh no! <laughs> so, the, the, so she kept doing things like you know when you have to like take so the easy Mary way Pine. around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you know that you like sometimes you could like do the leap, or you could take the safe route. Mm -hmm. She'd always take the leap, and then I'd have to get the quick time events. And like it was like a nightmare. She's like entrusting me with all that. Uh, but <laughs> I, probably the game I've played the most uniquely, or had like a unique experience with was I did a series on my YouTube channel called Fallout 3 Naked and Gunless, um, which I've <laughs> subsequently done with Fallout 4. And it's basically, I wanted to see if I could... Comp I, wa I wanted an excuse to replay Fallout 3. So I decided that I wondered if it was possible to play that game wearing no armor, and no clothes, and never using a projectile weapon. So... Uh, I did eventually it took a while and the whole series is up there uh, and that was like so much fun because it just it like forced lateral thinking in, in a really interesting way in a game that like supports lateral thinking and emerging gameplay and you know not all games do sure. and I subsequently have done it in Fallout 4 as well which was way harder <laughs> because that game is so much more focused on shooting um, and yeah it was like but you had to fudge it like at the, the first like you meet a death claw within the first hour of Fallout 4 and I had no I was literally in underpants with like I think a baseball bat I had at that stage uh, so we had to fudge it like it took like an hour and I basically you know whenever it would come up to the door I'd stay in a building and then hit it every now and again with with it with a bat and Preston Garvey was taking some uh, hit points off of it but it took forever uh, so probably that uh, Fallout 4 yeah playing those games naked and gunless was amazing but um I think I'm Fallout 4 was so hard. I think I'm done doing Naked and Gunless for a while anyway. It, you, you, well, it's hard. You handicap yourself going in, and you you take away game mechanics on purpose. And yeah, that, I can see why that. I'll, I'll say this. I'll put. I'll find. I'll go get the links. I'll put them down below. Needless to say, everything we talk about links will be down there. I'll remind everyone again at the end. But I do have one more of these kinds of questions. I want to ask cool. you. Cool. Like we, we are in a post No Man's Sky world. That was the right. peak. Here are the valleys. So where, <laughs> so where are you going from here in your most anticipated game? What are you looking forward to coming out soon? Or not soon? I don't know. For the rest of the year, I keep hearing really good things about Mafia 3 from people who've played it. Yes. Um, and it, like, which, is, which is interesting. I think, I think in terms of the theme, I'm hearing that they're not really going for the sort of the, the, the African-American experience story, which mm -hmm. I'm a little bit disappointed about because I'd like to see somebody like really yeah. go for that. Uh, but in terms of mechanically, it sounds like it's super interesting the way they're framing it with all the video. Um, there's like all this like fake footage stuff that they're shooting in between chapters. Um, so that seems really interesting. Uh, there's a bunch of games. Battlefield 1, that alpha I poured, like the closed alpha, I put 22 hours into that one map. And I didn't realize until I like saw the origin ticker and I was like, oh my god, like that was one map and I played for that long. Um, so I'm very interested in that. I, I was away for most of the, the public beta, but I did get to play a bit of it. Um, and I thought that was really cool as well. 
the two of them are the only two that are coming to mind right now. I'm trying to think what else is out for the rest of the year. There's Watch Dogs 2, which I'm interested in seeing because I live in Oakland and Oakland's right. in the game and the protagonist is from Oakland <laughs> and I really like the community here and I, I, I sort of I, I vibe out of like what's going on in Oakland. Um, and I used to live in SA, in San Francisco, so like that's that's going to be interesting. I believe it when uh, I see it, but The Last Guardian. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> slippage again. I, who knows, like, South Park's been pushed out of the year as well. Oh, it's uh, not It's not this year anymore? No, it got pushed back, yeah. Oh, it was I supposed to be that. December 10th, I yeah. think it was. I think yeah. it was the same day as The Last Guardian. Ooh, right. I, there's, and like, then three the, games coming out that day. I forget what Dead the Rising's is. the other one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to Dead Rising because that's like a weird Christmas game. Yeah, right. Like it's it's like it's a Christmas themed game coming out three weeks before Christmas. So I mean that's you know that's pretty funny. There's no better um, way to spend the holidays. Yeah, I mean like <laughs> there's not many Christmas themed games. Like actually, now that I think about it, I think maybe that first first person South Park game that came out on the Nintendo 64 yeah. and PlayStation One. I feel like that might be one as well. Uh, but there's so many games that came out this year that I haven't played yet. Like, I haven't played much Hitman at all. I've watched a bunch of Let's Plays of it, but I haven't had a proper dive into that. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of interested in playing some World of Warcraft, and I need to play the Bioshock collection. But, uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's been a good year. So I'm, I'm it, really to it. it really has. It really has. It's it's one of the better years uh, in recent memory. I, I'll say that, for me personally. Um, and then we also have, you know, the, the PlayStation VR coming out. Who knows yeah. what that's going to do? I mean... I, I have a huge fear that there's going to be some nausea involved with, with it. I really do. I mean, the frame rate, it takes a lot. I have a DK2, and you mm. know I haven't made the leap yet to Vive or, or uh, a CV1, but if a developer is making, an indie developer is making a title, it takes resources, time, and money to make sure that your game is stable. And when you have underperforming mm. hardware that's fearful that it's not going to be like hopefully they do the smart route and they give demos unlike oculus who doesn't right. give you demos anymore <laughs> so it's we'll not I, yeah i mean I, I i stayed off the vr train for a while because i had access in work sometimes yeah. um and because it was a bit of a, an investment uh <clears throat> the the weird thing about all the funding that we had uh, i'd saved so much of my own cash up that i was the, the one treat that i bought myself um, it's actually yesterday I ordered a Vive, so okay. um, that's that's going to arrive on Monday, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And I like did the floor plan and stuff, so hopefully it should all work. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to that, uh, sort of experiencing it for the first time, and and I'm gonna try and use it as a as a Trojan horse to get into Valve maybe as well <laughs> between between you and me. Um, <laughs> but my uh, uh, my I guess the PlayStation VR stuff that I'd done at GDC. And I'd done an E3. I was really impressed by it. It worked really good. But these were the house demos that they'd made themselves, right? But it worked really good for, for the kit that it was. I mean, it was nowhere near as, as good in terms of resolution as, as the, the Oculus or the, you know, the, the retail version of that. Uh, and actually, and the DK2 is, is, is pretty powerful yeah. um, against that and the, the Vive. It, you know, but for what it was, it was a sort of a, I don't know, a unique solution to it. And I think the consoles have another edge on that where they can... I don't know. Like, I feel like if you bought a PlayStation VR, the stuff that'll come out for that will be more, more curated than it is for the Oculus and the Vive, which is kind of like there's lots of stuff out there, and some of it's not very good. Um, so I hope so. My kind of worry is that Sony seem to be the ones pushing this one out to die a little bit. Like, they're they're not really yeah. making much of a. They're more interested in talking about the PlayStation Pro and the Slim, and I mean, it's out in a couple of weeks, right? Like three or four weeks or something. Yes, the Pro is coming out soon. Ah, eh, weird. <laughs> it's a weird the name. Professional. So we can be professionals instead of scrub amateur gamers, I think, PlayStation I, owners. I think I was listening to the Bombcast and Brad said the PlayStation 4K, which even though it does exclude, is, it excludes a certain group of people, it sounds so good. <laughs> right, yeah. Totally. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a weird console. It's like a half step. And yeah. I get why they did it because they want to keep that $400 price point sure. and, and fight, fight you know, Xbox that way. Um. But yeah, it's a little bit disappointing for somebody who's... I mean, 4K shit is like so far away from most people anyway. Like, people are going to worry about buying televisions sure. in maybe 12 months from now. I think that's a Christmas 2017 thing for everyone is the 4K TV. So, you know, it's a little bit early. All right. Um, I agree. And, I, you know, I lied to you. I lied to you about something in the beginning. I didn't mean, <laughs> I didn't mean to. But these aren't all, you know, just the, the, the fun video game questions. I have one here that I put last minute. And it's okay. because I, I got real deep into one of your videos that you had made at GameSpot. 
And um, I want to ask you about games versus depression really quick. Oh, yeah. Um, I watched that, and it, it, it hit home in a weird way, and I don't talk about it much. It's not really on the channel, but I suffer from extreme, extreme anxiety and OCD. I'm talking light switches for an hour sometimes, you know, that kind. It, it, it's nuts. It, it really does screw with you. And it was, a, it was an interesting insight on some other people's experiences and how they handle and how they cope and how they fell into it as well. I wanted to ask you, and I'll link that below. It's such a good thing. It has like... 175,000 views. It should have like. Does seven, it? It has like. Should have 40 million views. It, it, it should have. It, everyone should watch it. It's so good. And I'm going to put it down below. But I want to know what your takeaway was from that. Like, what was your experience after meeting the people in the video? In the video? And, and, and just what did you go home with? What kind of mindset did you. Were you left in? Thank you so much, first of all. That's that's very kind of you to say. That was like one of the first videos I'd done at GameSpot that wasn't like a normal traditional gaming thing. Kind of probably the first step on what I ended up sort of doing with Noclip. Um, what I learned from that one, I think, was that <laughs> what happens a lot of games coverage or like op-ed stuff like my show, The Point, is that it's generally like my perspective on things. Sure. But I think what I learned from that one is that actually if you... If you're doing it right, then you're letting the people, other people, tell the story for you. Sure. Um, and in that situation, I mean, th we had a bunch of really interesting people. Like Claire, who I interviewed, is such a unique individual. You know, she's stuck at home so much with her, um, with the sort of like medical condition that she has, like severe medical condition. If she'd been born 30 years ago, she'd be dead right now. But they're they're keeping her alive. Um, and that like PlayStation Home was such like a. An, an important part of her life like who would have thought like right. the, the the butt of every joke about playstation online was was actually like this super important thing uh, to her and her friends uh, so i think what i learned from that is like one i had license to talk about things about games that people weren't because i felt also like is this okay is it my place to talk about this i'm no expert and you know i'm, I'm not trying to draw any conclusion like the only conclusion we draw out of it is go get help like that's the only conclusion I kind of wanted to draw from it was like, there is no small fix to this. Games don't help. You know, they help some people as a coping mechanism, sure, but they also can, you know, be a negative coping mechanism. I forget, there's actually a term for that. I forget what it is. My uh, wife's a ther therapist. She'd be killing me if I if I <laughs> don't get this right. Um, but yeah, I think it was like, it was, it was that. It was the idea. It was looking at games outside of the context of just what's happening in the game. It's the human experience of, of playing games and what it means to us is as valid as what happens in the game itself um yeah and i mean you know what it's like it's it's like i i my light switch days are thankfully behind me but i know exactly how that feels um i used to get up in the middle of the night and have to run downstairs and and my one was that for the light switches was it was if my my finger was covered in paint and if i didn't touch it the right way mm -hmm. i'd have to re retouch it and then like you never get it the way it should have been at the start. So. Mine's sound based. Everything makes a certain click. You know what it sounds like when uh, you turn a light switch off. You know that yeah. click that it makes. But there's, depending on how fast or how slow or how soft or hard you do it, it makes a certain sound. And people just don't like. I've had like my own mother from from growing up would say, "Just don't do it. Just don't do it. You don't understand." Yeah. yeah the, the here's the best analogy I ever came up with to to describe OCD. I said, imagine someone taking your hands and pouring syrup all over your hands and then telling that person, don't wash your hands all day. Yeah. Do you realize how sticky, how awful, and how miserable you would be if you couldn't scratch that itch? That's the mm. same way with OCD. Unless you satisfy that, that moment, you, or essentially, you know, in the analogy, wash your hands, um, you're not satisfied. And there's nothing yeah. you can do. You have to do that. Uh, it's that's a good so that's a really good way of putting it and and th like there's two ways of fixing it one is that you you do it all the time and then the other one is the that you try and figure out a way of, of having it so the syrup disappears right which is easier <laughs> fucking said than done. <laughs> yeah so i think it's like you know i'm really lucky that i the treatment really worked for me and sort of like a good mix of, of medication and and um it's like it's like no, I was about to say psychotherapy. Jesus, um, uh, visits a psych a right. psychologist helped me out, but uh, yeah, I mean it's different for every person, and I think like talking about that stuff at least, like Alexander Bruce said, the best thing, uh, who's the developer of Antichamber, who I interviewed mm -hmm. in that, um, where he said like at least talking about it normalizes it in a way and makes people feel less weird about it, and the more you talk about it, the more other people can talk about it, then. Ultimately, you're helping everyone sort of on a path to a recovery or at least setting the, you know, pointing them in the right direction. So, 
Yeah, I mean, in a weird way, I feel like people who have a platform like I did at GameSpot, and certainly I have a platform now um, with my own thing, I think we have a debt to society to use that in a positive way whenever we get the opportunity. Most of the time, we're just talking about games, not really much you can do about it, um, and that's fine, that's the work, but like, I think also, you you know, if you're in a privileged position where you have an audience, you should use it for some good every now and again, you know? I agree 100%. Again, that link will be down below. Oh, our time is coming to an end close, very close. I want to throw in a few fan questions, if that is okay with you. Absolutely. Uh, Love this. This is fun. <laughs> I, Sorry I, I ramble so much. It's like, I always say it's it's because I'm Irish and that's the way we are, <laughs> but it's probably just because I'm a fucking rambler, so apologies. Well, it's, it's funny because I keep looking, like, I have my notes, I have my drink, which I can't drink, and I, <laughs> and I have uh, the timer here because at any moment, my kids are going to get home and the dog <laughs> is going to bark and that's the uh, disadvantage of working out of the basement with this stuff right <laughs> but um that's all but your, your commute home to see your kids is is super like beautifully short <laughs> it is it really is like that, that's that's a gift you know um i do want to let's see okay I, well you kind of touched on this already but if, if, if there's anything to add to it i want to i want to get it out there but a uh, sneaky mission ass and i believe he's from the um giant bomb subreddit Cool. But it says, how accessible do you feel that it will be getting the game developers and publishers uh, to talk about, you know, with you, all of the inside stuff uh, with Noclip? Uh, it, it varies game to game and publisher to publisher. So, for instance, one of the things I'm finding, um, which is interesting, is that games that are coming out in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. they are way more cagey than much bigger games that came out like two years ago. Like, the games that are already out, they've had their PR cycle, the game's out, people know what they are, and they're not, like, doing exclusivity deals with other websites and stuff like that. So, they're cool. They don't, they're like, sure, come talk to us about our game. In fact, weirdly, some of the biggest, like, the big projects, the ones I'm super excited about, are about games that came out, like, five and ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And those guys are just like, come on over. Like, they don't <laughs> mind at all. Like, we released this game years ago, we love it. We, you know, we, we, they're all older and they have their, probably, they're probably done quite well off of this stuff as well. So they're not really worried or anything. Uh, Can't give us so any games right now. Not one. No, I, I'd love to, you've no idea how much I want to, but I, I really can't because like all this stuff is <laughs> negotiation ongoing. So if like it popped up somewhere, you know what I mean? So I'm really hoping I'll be able to announce something. Well, in the I next had to ask, you know, I knew, weeks. I knew the answer oh, yeah. before I asked it, but I had to ask you. <laughs> you're doing, you're doing your job right. Exactly. Oh, uh, man. And, th and then the other thing is that certain publishers are a little bit more cagey than others. Uh, and I won't name names, but like, you know, you can imagine, like, bigger, the bigger they are, the more, you know, weird PR they've had around them, then sure. the more cagey they are. So, and a lot of it comes down to, like, it's weird, like, developers who, like, saw the Blizzard one, like, that's the one I send people because it's like, they go, oh, that's like Activision Blizzard letting you in. You asked questions that they probably wouldn't have necessarily wanted asked, but, like, you treated it in a respectful manner. And, like, the weird thing was, because the Titan stuff was kind of off the table when I was going there in the first place. But, like, I asked anyway, like like you just did. And, like, you know, and, and Metzen and Kaplan wanted to talk about that stuff. Sure. And then once it went up, the pure people were like, no, actually, yeah, you treated this in a respectful way. And um, I actually heard that they had sent that around internally at Blizzard and that the executive team had even seen it. So that means, like, Mark, Mike Morheim might have actually watched that video, which, like, blows my mind. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I think, like... A lot of it has to do with letting people know what this is and that it's not, I'm not turning it into clickbait headlines, sure. that it's a respectful dive. And, and the more I'm hoping, the more of these I do, the easier it'll get. Absolutely. Um, okay, so the next question comes from, uh, I feel like we're almost like, like double like exclamation pointing some of the points because we have gone into a lot of this stuff, but uh, not lurking anymore too asks, um, what was your favorite uh, content before you left GameSpot? What was your favorite kind of content to do? You know, be it a podcast or, or, or you know, like almost like a documentary series that you, mm. you, you were doing toward the end, especially like the, um, the what was it, the um, Grand Theft Auto 4 one that you put right. out. Like, yeah. that was so good. It was so good. But what was your favorite? Thanks so much. That's really kind of you to say. I, I love doing that stuff. The point was like my little creative like sandbox so i kind of mm -hmm. just did anything in there uh, and i enjoyed doing a lot of those that i think maybe the one that i enjoyed the most was the tony hawk pro skater episode i did which was because i grew up skateboarding and like that's the perfect example of american culture permeating ireland you know and, and permeating the world is that i played a video game and learned about skateboarding and i knew about what bands to listen to and i knew what like royal trucks were and toy machine wheels and i knew <laughs> 
like I went the first first time I ever went to America, I was in LA for Call of Duty XP and there was a big meal for all the press and I went, No, I'm not going to that and going to Venice Beach because I remember that from Tony Hawk's Pro Skater too. So that was what I always wanted to do was like talk to him about the fact that his game was part of the movement which like spread skateboarding around the world. And I did an interview with him at E3 and I interviewed one of my buddies from my hometown who just so happened to be in San Francisco like a week later. And that's probably the most proud thing I've had. That was something that was like in my head to do for like I was like somebody should do that shit like 15 years ago. And then I did it. And like, it only has like, you know, it's loads <laughs> of views for, it's it's for GameSpot. It's not that many. It has like forty five thousand views on YouTube. But I fucking love it. It's like, I have other ones that have like millions, but like that's the one. That's it's the sentimental. That's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. It's fucking. I love that story. It's great. Like, I'd love to do it again for NoClip because I think it's like fascinating. And his insight into it was really interesting as well. Well, now you're your own boss, sir. So you can <laughs> exactly. you can do what you want. <laughs> In my underpants. There you go. Um, so, okay, there are a lot of, uh, when I reached out for questions, a lot of Giant Bomb came my way, which I, you know, yeah. I, I, I adore Giant Bomb. Um, <laughs> I, but I do have probably the most important question that I will ask out of this whole interview. This is the end all be all. Everyone needs to know, and I'm, I'm almost afraid to ask you, but will you still be Giant Bomb's European sports <laughs> analyst? <laughs> Like, I'll be completely honest, one of the saddest parts about leaving CBSI was leaving those guys. Because, like, that could have been, like, you know, I did so much stuff on Giant Bomb. I, you know, me and Jeff, I, Jeff's always been really good to me. Like, he was basically my professional hero, you know what I mean? And, like, now he's someone who I'm really fortunate to be able to call a friend and somebody who certainly helped me a lot over the past couple of months in figuring this thing out and, and launching it and stuff. Like, um, the dude's amazing. Uh, uh, and, like, on my last... Uh, when I was on on Professional Friday, I think that might have been the only moment where I, like, I realized, oh, fuck, like, I am actually... Yeah. Like, I in the back of my head, I was like, oh, we're going to do dancers some more... And he's going to, you know, Riker's moving to the East Coast. And that was the funniest part, actually, was everyone saying, like, oh, he's got to go to Giant Bomb. And, <laughs> and he's got to go to Giant Bomb East. And I'm like, no, no, Riker is, but you guys don't know yet. And I can't say. Um, so when. Although, by I get, the way, I want to say something. Back when I first sure. asked you to be on the show, I made a joke on Twitter with you about, like, oh, you're in New York getting ready for Riker's wedding, huh? And then he got engaged. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was amazing. I wasn't sure if he did. I wasn't sure if he'd announced it yet, so I could have easily gone like, "Oh yeah, isn't it great news?" <laughs> so that was that was dodgy. Uh, but yeah, I do. I, I mean, I, I'm in to do the Alt F1 every week with with Drew. We're gonna do dancers. I told Brad, open invite. I live like 40 minutes away, so if they ever need me for the bombcast, I'll be happy to go in. Or any of that stuff, I'd be happy to go in. Uh, it's up for them to pick up the phone. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure they will. So, uh, I mean, hopefully, I. I Look, you can't have your cake and eat it, and not being there all the time is right. is really difficult. And stepping away from your professional heroes, but at a certain time, it was like I, Gamespot wasn't the place for me anymore. And like it was so so, you've no idea how flattering it is because I've been like a day one Giant Bomb member, like arrow pointing down episode mm -hmm. one podcast I was in, day one subscriber I was in. Uh, and so you've no idea how like flattering it was for people to. Like, like the stuff when I was on Giant Bomb. Like, I read every comment when that Bioforge video went up. And then for people to, like, be so supportive. I and I noticed a huge... <laughs> yeah. God. I love Vinny so much. Backflips uh, and Bioforge is still one yeah. of my favorite pieces of content to ever flow out of there. And a lot of people's introduction to you, like, from yeah. the Giant Bomb side. So... God, it was so funny. I, I, was, I thought there was a fork there. I was going to pick it up and say, a fork. Yeah. <laughs> Well, but the Giant Bomb community like has my has my back as well with this, which is really amazing. Uh, I've, yeah, I feel so so lucky to have spent like any time sitting on those videos. And what well, the great thing is now, I get to like I was watching them <laughs> doing the podcast live on Tuesday, right. and I'll watch UPF later. Like I'm I'm I know not to counter program UPF on my live stream, so I'm gonna finish at three o'clock and probably watch some of that and send some emails. So it's great. Danny, our time is uh, has come to a close. I, I I know you you have a lot planned and things that you you have to get to so i don't want to take up any more of your time i'm very gracious that you've given me this much i'm gracious that you res, uh rescheduled with me again thank you for that everything that we talked about no clip the patreon links twitter the videos that we mentioned i'll try to remember as much as possible 
and I'll try to make this a non-edited uh, atrocious mess on top of it. But thank you very much, and this has been Episode 8 of What They Play. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you for watching this episode of What They Play. I really, really want to send out a special thank you again to Danny for both rescheduling and coming on the show. It really does mean a lot. All those links, like I said, are down below. Go check them out. It means a lot to me, and I'm sure it means a lot to him. And also, it's been like two days since I've actually recorded that episode because of all the technical issues that I had, as you saw in the beginning of the episode. But regardless of that, I'm still glad I was able to do it. I'm still glad you guys get to see it. <laughs> But it is the end of the video, and that means there's just one more thing left to say. You know the drill. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, become one of the Titans! And I'll see you guys in the next video!